we used to mention music of Fichte. Why were some, I, I guess you could call them conservative Catholic musicians, why were they against key signatures? Like they would say, no, I would refuse to put sharps and flats and everything. This is false music. Can you, do you have any perspective on that? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a great question. Um, I've actually, some years ago, I published an article in Journal of Musicology that looks at this question. The number one practical reason is that the books are ancient books and they've been around for a long time. You know, very often, mind you, in the 17th century, they might be using a plain chant book to sing from that's hundreds of years old. They might also be using a 17th century copy of a plain chant. So take for example, here's, here's something that's really interesting. The influence on plain chant and polyphony is not one way, it's both ways. And so what you have in the 17th century is the application of, in, in, not just application of ficta to plain chant, for example, leading tone cadences, crazy but also complete transformation of the mode through application of a key signature so that Aeolian becomes, or so that Phrygian becomes Aeolian. This has happened. How do we know this? Well, if you look at the Cathedral of Florence and you go back and you look at the beautiful, you know, Medici uh, codices that they have of plain chant, you know, absolutely beautiful plain chant. You're not going to write sharps or flats in there. Now, these, are, these are works of art that are, you know, they belong right up there with, you know, Michelangelo's staircase for the, you know, for the Biblioteca Laurentiana. You know, these are, these are beautiful, beautiful works. So you're not going to write sharps. So um, theorists uh, like Coferati would write plain chant treatises in which they say, here's how to add sharps and flats to plain chant, even though it's not written. And that phrase, even though it's not written, is really important. <laughs> this is not because necessarily of the kinds of polyphonic, troponal drivers that we see in 14th century music or early 15th century music. It's, it, it has to do more with the juxtaposition of plain chant and organ. So the organ versets are playing. You know, you'd, you'd sing a verse with a choir of a psalm and, or Magnificat, and then the organ would improvise and you go back and forth. Well, it's really jarring. The organ plays leading tones and the choir doesn't. So it appears from the evidence of numerous treatises of this period, Coferati, Marinella, Portaferrari, um, and then also a number of French treatises as well, that plain chant was often inflected with sharps and flats, leading tones at times, mm. or it could be other notes that would radically change the way that you experienced the music. It would not have been such a jarring contrast between plain chant modality and uh, keyboard major minor tonality or whatever That's, church so, tones yeah. are using. Yeah, so for instance, like if you have an A minor, I use that in quotes, tonality, mm -hmm. and that you have mm -hmm. the G below it, mm -hmm. it, will that be a sharped G? And, or is that a later practice? Or is it like, did they go G yeah. natural to A? Uh, what, what, so what's the answer there? Well, did they always yeah. sharp the G and it's not notated? Yeah. Yeah, I think that the traditions here are uh, local and regional, and it's uh, in when it comes to liturgical practice, especially in the 17th century, it's almost impossible to make blanket mm. uh, generalizations about they always did this or they never did this. There was always somebody doing it, and there was also someone who could never do it. Like, so, for example, churches like uh, the Cathedral of Lyon, they had a permission that allowed them from time immemorial not to do polyphony. And so they had a very conservative plain chant practice there. Uh, you look at other places like the Cathedral of Florence, and it, it, it appears quite certain that they were inflecting plain chant in the 17th century from the influence of polyphony, even though it was unaccompanied plain chant. Now, then you also get into this whole other very complicated area, which is picked up by Padre Martini. Uh, and then and then this starts to get it over into the Partimento tradition. Some of those some of those people in the late 18th and early 19th century of accompanied plain chant, which, you know, for the monks of Salem was an absolute abomination. Yeah. Here we have my <laughs> beloved Padre Martini. I have spent. So we love time. this guy. We I love this guy. guy. I, he is perhaps one of my favorite early modern people. I have spent so much time 
with those books that he collected so lovingly and all of those student uh, manuscripts, you know, that he and subsequent librarians collected of student notes. And, you know, really you get into the, these ma the manuscript traditions surrounding these performance practices of plain chant and polyphony and organ versetti and the way that they relate to each other that the the manuscript tradition is so revealing about that you see things there that you don't see in the printed sources uh, it's yeah, yeah I, I love him didn't didn't he he shared a love of early for him for him early music so ancient music oh, think, according to him so did yeah. he lament uh the set like changes uh, or did he was he sort of trying to preserve some traditions and what in his writings do we know any insights into performance practices or or tonal theory i use tonal of course in quotes uh mm -hmm. of the renaissance and early does he talk about was he a theorist in that regard talking about like tone like uh, modes and stuff yeah. He, he does talk about it, but, you know, to be honest, I haven't looked at his own writings about that mm. since the 90s. Uh, he's, he is a lot of things. <laughs> he's a pedagogue. You know, of course, he's the one who famously corrects Mozart's uh, test mm. piece, the antiphon and fugue for, for the Academia Philharmonica. And I've had the privilege of looking at that, you know, and working with his materials. Uh, and, of course, he has a multi-volume history of Western music, which... Mm -hmm. He like barely got out of antiquity with volume four. I forget how many volumes it is. It's really fun because <laughs> each, I mean, I was so inspired with, I'm a, I'm an absolute canon nut. You know, I, I'm a canon yeah. fiend and um, I do canons like some people do crossword puzzles and he, um, each chapter has a canon, right? So he has, he's very historical and he's very much a historian of music theory, but I can't say that he, I, you know, I'm just not coming up with, memories of a lot of in-depth discussion of late 18th mm. century theory, like from okay. his own perspective. It's more historical orientation, but one of the most important things he did was his collation of this incredible collection, which is memorialized in the famous Crespi bookcase. And it's, mm. you know, for me, it's like old friends, you know, I, you see the painting on Crespi had this beautiful, you know, Padre Martini had a bookcase and Crespi painted a painting on the outside of it of all the books with the titles on the pages and stuff. And those books are in the collection. And so back in the day when I was able to actually work with the actual books and not just microfilms or digital scans, uh, these, these books are friends, you know. 